All right, we are live. Hey guys, this is Jennifer from the Shooter's Mindset. Hope everyone is doing well on this Tuesday evening and has gas and all the good things in life that we need. We've got tonight our co-host Greg Cannon is here. How you doing? Good. How about y'all? Doing well. And we have another co-host tonight since um, Anthony is sometimes not with us every week. Um, so Paul McCoy has offered to come and sit in and help us co-host and help if one of us is out, which would be nice because sometimes I do like to take vacations. So welcome, Paul. How's it going? Good. Thank you all for having me back. Yeah. Good to have your knowledge base and uh, expertise. It's nice to have somebody else on the show that actually knows what they're talking about. <laughs> How about we have got Morgan King here, the NRL champion with us tonight. How's it going, Morgan? Oh, pretty good. How are you guys? Doing well. Yeah. So for anybody that doesn't know you, I don't know how that would be possible right now unless you're living under a rock, but for anybody that doesn't know you, kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into precision shooting. Uh, um, I'm from Kaysville, Utah. Um, I live in Logan, Utah right now. I'm in, I'm in vet school, actually, and uh, I got in precision shooting – just growing up hunting and uh as i i'm kind of i don't know i've always been a little bit uh ocd so my i learned to re reload from my grandpa in high school and he didn't he was not very ocd let's just say that and i, I started he started saying well you know you throw some you throw the powder like this with a little powder throw and then i started measuring it on a scale and he's like well it's just fine as long as it's close then you're good you know and, and, you know, you just go over to a book and you would just pick a load out of nowhere, you know, with a 150 grain spitzer and a 30 out six or something load right in the middle of it. And then, <clears throat> so that then if your powder throw went over, you didn't blow your gun up or anything. And well, that wasn't good enough for me. And so I just slowly built from there and started learning how to just, um, dial things in as I got older, uh, I started wanting more and more accurate guns because I couldn't, uh, it, for some reason, when I learned that you hold over uh, to hit something out there a little ways, because out here in Utah, um, I'm sitting on the mountain right now in my truck. And uh, when you're out here hunting, you know, sometimes the closest shot you're ever going to get is 400 yards. And so when you're holding over for that, not really knowing where, where to hold over, that just was something that wasn't real enjoyable to me. So I had to figure out how to, how to dope it, and it just snowballed snowball just <laughs> yeah till here we are and now yeah. here we are <laughs> yeah it's like a couple of years after that pretty soon i built the gun and then yeah i went to a match thought that was pretty cool but i wrote cows my whole life uh just rodeoing traveling doing that that's why people ask me all the time they're like when are you gonna slow down and i'm like uh shoot i just got out of school i i it's time to go uh, I'm used to going to two, three rodeos a weekend, every weekend, all summer, um, traveling all over the place. So then, uh, last year when COVID hit, slowed down roping. So then I just started shooting, shooting started going good. So then I just kind of was like, well, let's just roll with this. Started traveling, shooting like I rope and then it just snowballed, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You've been on fire in 2021 like most recently like we said you brought home the win at the nrl championship uh and the parma precision rifle rumble so yeah, a couple days ago tell us about both of those um how was the match and how did it feel winning winning the nrl championship uh you know i i flew in wait so it was it was finals week the week after uh the nrl championship so I knew it was going to be tight. I told everybody, I was like, ah, I'm not going. I can't go. Uh, the NRL kept hitting me up about getting in. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I can go yet. I'll, I'll get in when I can. And uh, so I waited. And um, sorry, I was looking at the chat thing. But uh, I waited until uh, like the last minute. I think I, I got in like 10 days before because I figured uh, that I would – um, um, I, I said I would, uh, uh, get in if I could study a couple three weeks before, start studying before and get ready for all my finals. Cause 
uh, my, uh, my finals are pretty intense and I had a final the Friday before I left, got on a plane right after the final, uh, showed up at about one in the morning there, con somebody into picking me up at the airport and, uh, got dropped off the hotel at like two 30, slept for a couple hours, showed up, zeroed the rifle and started shooting. And, uh, you know, at that point it was just all muscle memory cause I was hardly awake. And, uh, you know, finally I woke up a couple stages in and started, uh, kind of feeling it and you know that the targets at neither one of these last matches uh they were both i would say average point four so it was a smaller target match and the ranges um at both matches was inside of a thousand so it wasn't like that was a big deal and it but uh you know it's been something to win the nrl championship's been like on my bucket list for a long time because i mean it's kind of one of those deals where it kind of started on the west coast and to be able to uh, kind of bring it home to the West Coast is kind of cool. So uh, I was pretty pumped by the last stage because I knew going into it, if you've ever shot with me, I'm kind of like a OCD. I know where everybody's at all the time. So uh, John Pinch, he, he was uh, staying and kind of watching because I was getting towards the beginning, towards the end of the match in the squad order. And so he would stick back and see where like uh, – um, Austin would finish on the stage because it was basically we figured it was between me and Austin going into the last you know four or five stages because he was shooting pretty good I was shooting pretty good uh, and I had the lead but I just was like okay what what did he get on the last stage and he's like oh you got an eight so and he's like okay drop two so I only need a six if I get a six I win the match I win the the thing and so I got six points was all pumped finished the stage got, ended up getting nine and uh I think he ended up dropping a couple and I don't know because I didn't stay to watch him because I was already in the rental about within two shooters. I was already on the way back to the airport and had to miss the awards, but I made it. I made finals and it all worked out. I don't know how that happened, but uh, I don't remember a whole lot of it because I didn't sleep at all, but you know, it was fun. I ought to be young again. We've all yeah. been there. Yeah. Thank you. So, you got to do it when you're young, I guess. I'm over for three days after. Yeah. So uh, are you going to shoot the AG Cup again this year? I, I'm going to sure try. Uh, depends on, like, say, vet school finals and all – or vet school, I guess, at that point. That's the one – it's in – I want it's in November, right? Again, or is it in December this year? December. I can't remember. December? It'll kind of just depend on tests and stuff, whether or not I can make it. I'm going to sure try, though. You know, the AG Cup is what I thought the PRS would have become 10 years ago or seven years ago when it first started. That was that was kind of where I thought the PRS was going, and it took a lot longer to get there than I thought it would in this whole thing. I'm sure. But I'm glad, I'm sure glad, I'm glad that you guys there. can make some money. You know, I'm glad there's a way for you to actually make enough money to make this worth doing. Yeah. Uh, you're, you come from F-Class world, right? Me? Yeah. No, no, I was one of the original 150 people in the PRS. Okay. I didn't know. I just would recognize your name. I don't know where I recognize it from, but must oh, have been from there. I've once or twice. John, John Finch and all them guys know me. So oh, I, yeah. I used to shoot out there with David McNeil and uh, all those guys. and uh, It's a good group of guys out there. Everybody gets along really well. There's not a lot of drama. Uh, no. You know, I enjoyed I probably the favorite match I ever shot was in Idaho where we're kind of shooting off the side of a mountain onto a you know down into a valley. That's a cool there's just some cool terrain out there where you're at that you don't get to shoot, you know, in the eastern part of the United States. Yeah, we just shot that match uh, about a month ago. It was the last NRL match of the season. That's a that's a fun that's been always one of my fun, my favorite matches. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a good one. What did you well, think cool. about the AG Cup format? Did you like it better or? You know, it. I do, I do actually really, really enjoy that style of match. I don't, I, w I really wish it was a three-day match. I think that'd be so cool because, you know, uh, I hesitate to say it, but whatever, I'll say it anyway. But I think there's only a handful of guys in the country that maybe can win a two-day match let alone a three-day match because it just takes so much consistency. It's mental, mental uh, 
stuff. I mean, there's a lot. There's obviously a lot of guys. A lot of guys have done it, and a lot of guys can do it. But the group of guys that can do it, like, grows exponentially when you drop it down to a one-day match. And so that's the only issue I see with the format. But I do think, like, I don't I, – I do think it – it's it's one way to do it now I, I mean it's cool because it's like every day uh you get to start over and you know it's it's now or never type of deal do or die which is kind of fun oh it's, 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 it's hard to be good two days in a row as it is one but it's it's way harder than that to be good three days in a row yeah exactly that's exactly kind of what it, I'm, it becomes it becomes a compounded curve of trying to maintain consistency uh, because typically everybody kind of has conditions they shoot well in and conditions that they don't like. And it's hard to have conditions you like for three days. You know, I always liked it when the wind blew. And the harder the wind blew, the happier I was, because that takes kind of takes the luck. And, it, and it, it takes, you know, some guy just having the best day of his life kind of out of the equation. Some guys, you know, just got his dope down. And so, but, uh, you know, a one day match and a two day match is a whole different, a whole different thing. And it's, it's, I'm with you. I think three days. If you're gonna if you're gonna shoot the best of the best, make them shoot three days. Let's see who can really hold it together for three days, and uh, who can come back because typically everybody has a bad stage or a bad couple of stages, and it's the people that have the mental strength to come back from that that really are the ones that that end up rising to the top. And so you're gonna typically have one one or two bad stages a day, especially at that level with those difficult stages. And uh, so I think that's a really good point, Morgan. I think that three days, three days for the for the best shooters, uh, really would put the pressure on them to see who could maintain uh, both physically and mentally. I, th I think that's a, a very fair uh, arena for that level of skill. And I get what they're doing because they gotta they gotta run a TV show, and it's they want the excitement on the last day, you know. And but I I think that if it, there's a way to do it, maybe. If they uh, shuffled it, shuffled the squads to where the top 10 were shooting against each other on day three, and that's the squad that they end up following with the video camera, that might be a better way to kind of maybe, you know, stay within the drama, shall we say, with a TV camera. But I don't know. I'm not – I'll shoot it however they do it because, you know what, that's a lot of money, and I'd sure like to make it. <laughs> So you like to know where you stand. You said you count up everybody's score along the way. So you liked the scoreboard at AG Cup. 100%. Love it. I want to see where I'm at all the time. You thrive well with the pressure and knowing what you got to get to. I want to know, right? Like, yeah, I, I love it. If I can, because I the other thing is, is uh, if I didn't love it, I'd make myself love it because I don't ever want that to get in my head. So I want to have hundred percent control over my, my mental like state, I guess. And if, uh, if some, if, if hearing where I'm at or anything like that would come and affect me, then, you know, then, then I feel like I don't have control over my mind, I guess. So, which then I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at, there's a weakness in what I'm doing. Which I guess, you know, we all have our weaknesses and stuff, and but I just don't, I don't want that to be one of them, I guess. That is 100% one of my weaknesses. Um, two weekends ago, I was shooting my, my own NRL 22 match, and one of my buddies, he just felt like saying, I think the first day she goes, oh, you're going to clean this one unless you uh, drop one more shot. You're doing pretty good. Somehow, I mean, it was a, it was a, my, that 22, it, it doesn't miss. It doesn't have flyers. Like, don't know what happened, but the bullet just decided it wasn't going to hit the target. And then he got me again on another stage. He's like, oh, only only two more shots. He'll have this one clean. Ping! <laughs> no clue how it happens. It's like some sort of a outside force that affects that, apparently. Well, say well I think... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, at AG Cup, I noticed that you're very, very um, calm, cool, and collected, like, the whole time. Like, I saw a lot of guys get totally unnerved at AG Cup. <laughs> when I saw you, you were just like, yeah. Man, I was so tired. I don't even know if I knew where I was at. Time to shoot. 
like you're like whatever you know and it, it just so laid back like just smiling and having a good time and whatever you know you, you didn't seem to let the pressure get to you at all well I try not to so I appreciate it I, I know you were having fun on that PRS barricade stage heck yeah that was a good stage and like the that was a, uh, that was a fun stage the, the the four minutes you were winning it for yeah for I don't even know if it was that long like that's 90 seconds exciting thing of ag cup because we're like everybody's yeah. like oh he's got it he's got it and i think you had even walked off and um oh yeah i had no idea anybody beat me i just left and he thought he had won it and somebody's like yeah morgan won and we're all like no he didn't and they're like yeah he did we just watched him and we're like nope the guy that went like two after him like just barely i mean i think it was down to the hundreds of a second or something it was so yeah cool. i so, actually and then and then austin beat him after that yep yep so t- two people got me. So it was like, dang. And you know what? The funny thing was, is so I didn't know that guy got me, but I knew Austin did because Jake, um, Jake uh, is like, here's my plate bag. Cause I felt like, you know, 40 low forties is about as fast as you get. Unless you, is, unless you uh, attach your bag to your rifle or move your bag with your gun, which I hate moving my bag with my gun. And I hate attaching a bag to a rifle. So I'd always rather just move my bag, put my gun on it, shoot. But, uh, you know, so I, I didn't because I didn't need to. I was like, oh, low 40s, I can do that without. And then Austin goes up there. Jake pulls out his bag, says, here, use this. I'm like, you effer. What a traitor. You know, and then he goes up there and he does it. I mean, you got you definitely have more wobble with it. But like if you if I mean, he didn't have anything to lose. So it's like he knew he's going to make day he wasn't gonna win win the day so he's like whatever better it's better to make it to day two with a thousand bucks in my pocket than it is to, to make just make day two right so may as well send it you know that's pretty amazing you guys have got that thing down to 40 seconds or so i i was actually shoot, i shot a matchup in washington state and i can remember running that barricade cleaning it in 57 seconds and at that time that was, I mean, guys were just in disbelief that you could do it in 57 seconds. And I thought, yeah, I'm kind of like, yeah, I didn't really think it was that that difficult. But but to see where you guys have taken the amazing, it's, it doesn't surprise me because you're, you're, you guys are a lot younger than I am. But uh, it's, it, I kind of wonder where it'll stop. You know, will it, will it get to, will it get to 30? Will it get to 20? You know, I don't, I think there's a physical limitation at some point where you just, doesn't matter what, well, it, you're just a limitation. I- I think Scott Peterson's ran it in 28, 29. I know Dave Preston has too. They're freaking unreal. It's like, yeah, I, I don't, uh, that's amazing. Yeah. G- actually, that day, Austin was like, what, 39 or something to beat me? I don't know if you guys remember. I can't remember what it was, but y'all were. Yeah, I feel like it was very funny to see the different strategies because some people were very conservative. I mean, there were some people that used a bipod. Yeah, freaking tape. Yep. Bipod and a tri and a tripod. Mm-hmm. It's like, dude. Yep. He had all the pods. So, but he said <laughs> he said it was more important to me to get my hits to make sure I got all eight hits and move on. And it worked. The strategy worked well for him because he did well in AG Cup overall. But it was funny to see the different people that their strategy was to win or go for overall, or the people that were like, nope, man, I'm no guts, no glory. I'm going to try and get this, you know, stage win. And really we're not as conservative. So it was really funny to watch. Well, we were lucky because we were last, we were the last squad on it, or we were one of the last squads. I thought we were, I think we were the last squad on that because I walked over the scoreboard and was like, okay, uh, I can drop two, I think. And then um, if I drop two, I still make it to day two. So it doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. And or no, it was day three at that point. That's right. So I was like, man, if I drop two, I'm fine. So if I drop one, then I just slow down and and uh, get my hits. But I never dropped one, so I never slowed down. That's awesome. So you came from rodeo into precision rifle shooting. Um, are there any skills yep. and mindsets that you kind of developed there that you've kind of brought over or, you know, s- similar similar things that you use to help you in your shooting yeah yeah roping is a so rope i rope calves and it's kind of an explosive sport because you're you've got you know you got to try to tie a calf in say eight seconds 
you got to be able to score, run them down, rope the calf around the neck, get off the horse, run down, flank him, and tie him up. And then as soon as you're, as soon as you're done tying and your hands leave the pig and string, the time stops. So, and you got to do all that in eight seconds. So it's a lot of efficiency of motion and, and doing things fast and explosive and, and, and the, having the right mindset when you go into that, because you can, you can completely, if you don't have the right mindset and you go into it lethargic, you're going to, it makes a huge difference. And so, uh, it's just all mental. And so, and then, and then also, uh, the nice thing about that is the way we practice it. Uh, I've taken a lot of the way I practice for open and translated it over into this, where I break things down into steps and I, uh, so I don't get ahead of myself and I break every little thing down into a step and I have a process mentally that I go through so that, you know, I don't, I don't skip things. I don't, uh, I, I, to try to eliminate those little mental mistakes, like, you know, where not knowing the targets at, not having your dope written down, not having all those little tiny things that can nickel and dime you into, you know, from first to 20th, you know, uh, or, or it can take you from, from second to winning by 10 or 11, like last week, you know, it's just like, it's, it's those little things that go a long ways. And that's where roping it's, that everything was about little things because it's about tenths of a second. You know, it's funny you say that because I've, I uh, have done some things in my life. I work for an NHRA uh, pro stock drag racing team and it's success is kind of a formula. You know, everything you just said, it's attention to detail. And when I used to teach barricade shooting, I would say, look, it's not one or two big things. It's my left knees bent, my right legs not bent, my, you know, my hips are here, my elbows here. It's a million little bitty things, but you coming from rodeo where you're having to, to, to literally break that entire process of getting off that horse and tying that calf down into incremental little bitty steps. And you're having to perfect each one of those little bitty steps. That's exactly what PRS shooting is. It, it, you probably couldn't have found a better training ground for this type of, of stuff. So it doesn't surprise me that you're doing really well at it. But anything you pursue that you're trying to get good at, that's really what it comes down to is you have to break it down into little bitty steps and perfect each of those little bitty steps. And so you've uh, you've done very well. I'm very proud of you. You kind of came out of nowhere. I'd never heard your name before. You were standing on Facebook in your blue jeans holding a trophy for first place somewhere. And I thought, who is this kid? Where did he come from? I, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've never heard of this guy. So it, it doesn't surprise me now that you, you've picked it up as well as you have because you it's the same thing. You're just doing it. You're doing rifles instead of instead of roping calves, but it's the same process. Success, being successful, is the same process. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think you look at most, a lot of the top guys in the game right now, uh, and in not every one of them, obviously, because it, this can be the place that people, you know, come out and they they learn how to do it. But uh, they learn that kind of the formula, like you're talking about. But uh, you look at a lot of the top guys. You look like Clay. He was a he he was a college baseball player. Um, John Pinch was a professional skier. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It actually Austin he roped calves and team roped and like the, you know all those people they come from all these other places and they've had to learn that like throughout their childhood because shoot PRS hasn't been around all that long you know really um, and so we you know you learn these things from other places and I think a lot of people do um, but. I do know there's other people that just came. This is this is the thing that they do, you know, and they started doing. <laughs> yeah. So it it sounds like you have like a, a very strict routine when you when you approach a stage, right? Uh kind of. I mean, you've seen me at a match. I mean, I guess. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't look like it, but yes. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you're just kind of like walking around smiling i'm like all right y'all let's shoot stuff yeah exactly that's what it looks like but uh sometimes there's a lot rolling around in that little brain uh and it, the way i go about things i have to do things i have a process that i that i've that i continually tweak all the time um in order to because i always figure i want to be able to shoot stupid i guess is my kind of my thing is like I want to be able to, cause I, I mean, I am pretty airheaded and 
all over the place, but uh, I figure if I do the things in my process that it, it puts me in a place where it sets me up for success. So what's, uh, what, what is your process while, while a person is stage? Yeah. You, know, you walk, you walk up, you just clean the stage. How much money you, you got? Next one. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I'm looking for some quarters. I ain't got a whole lot right now. I shoot PRS. I'm broke. Yeah, I'm just kidding. What I I shoot PRS too. I'm broke too. Yeah. Uh no, uh when I, I think uh dope rifle scope win. That's all I that's I and then I, I just walk up there, find all the targets, I arrange every target every time. Uh it's uh and when I do that I, I find everyone, I range everyone. Every now and again you're gonna find one that's off. Not always, but some some of them are. It, it's like once every few matches you're gonna find one and it and when they're off they're not off that far until you find one that's really off and that one happens every now and again um but it's like it's funny i go up the stages and i like like bing 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 and i'm like oh hey that range is off of there oh go check the updated ranges or like we just said that in the brief or whatever because <laughs> i'm airheaded and i don't listen to the brief but i range the, target, not the only so, one so it doesn't matter i i I, cause I arrange them all of my, in my process, it doesn't matter. I, you know, I just know that. And then I go through and I look at the stage. So, uh, so then I, I got my dope as far as that goes. I'm, I mean, I put it all in my Kestrel and then I, I still don't write it down because I like to get my wind before I write, write down my dope. So then I go through, set my rifle up, make sure I got my bipod, all the bags I want for the stage ready. Um, then I then I go up there, check my scope, check my parallax, check my windy shirt, check my power, check my uh, um, elevation, set it to where it needs to be, um, and then um, then I think wind, and I just go back there and start looking at the wind, and and uh, I go through all that, and then I get my wind brackets all figured out and everything, and once I once I get the wind down and I write it all down, and I write my dope down and. I'm good to go. I can go do whatever the heck I want after that. You know, <laughs> like I can go mess around, do whatever. Uh, and then I, I'll usually check that again and make sure that's updated. If you ever walk up to my, walk up to me on stage, uh, a couple of shooters before I go, I might have a whole book written on my arm board, but uh, <laughs> I got enough to where, where if I get up there about anything that happens, I can figure it out. And, uh, and then uh, the other thing I do is whenever I get off a of stage, I walk straight to my backpack and I load my mag and I, I, uh, I write my score down and I, I always do that. And then I, I saw, and I always have a backup mag on my side and then I have a mag in my, in my, uh, in my, I have two loaded mags on my backpack. So at any time, if I need a, if I need a mag, I throw, I throw one of those two in the gun and then I always have a backup just in case anything, anything drastic happens. Let's say the, really the backup. Good. I'm sorry, yeah, I, I I love the backup mag thing, you know, coming from USPSA and three gun, um, you know, we always had to have a, we, we called it the oh shit mag, the one you really exactly. weren't planning on using, but you, you had to have it. And it has definitely saved me more than once in, in PRS. So yeah, I, I always went straight back and reloaded my magazine because that was my biggest fear was going into a stage with a, with a mag that wasn't reloaded. But uh, yeah, I like to say that I always had a plan for the wind that I thought was going to happen. And then a plan for if it was more and a plan for if it was less. And then a plan for if it was a lot more and if it was a lot less. So if you, you know, it sounds like kind of what you're doing is you, you've got the middle and then you go, you go just outside the middle and then you go way outside the middle. So you've got a plan for, you know, and it, it, it's, it's funny that how often the wind ends up being way off from what you thought it was going to be and way off from what everybody else in your squad said it was going to be or, or said it was. Oh yeah, that's what this weekend the guys are uh, in my squad were joking all the time, like, "Oh, the wind just lays down for you." Just, the, and I'm like, "Whatever, it freaking don't die." They're like, "Well, it might not die, but it don't change." And I'm like, "Well, it doesn't look like it, does it?" And because uh, you know, I mean, I'm I watch things and try to make corrections as often as I can, often as I can to try to get them back in the middle of the plate. But, uh, but but sometimes I walk up there and. You, you know, you watch the guy before you get off the line and you're like, oh, what'd you do? It's like, oh, four tenths. And then I look at the wind and I'm like, oh, that's no, there's no way that's going to work right now. Cause it just all of a sudden picked up. And then pretty soon you're, 
you're you walk i walk up there and i'm like oh let's try seven hit right in the middle you know it's like this little things like that where i i get usually have enough written down to where if that big pickup or let off happens where i can look down and you know have an idea of what to do and be able to figure out what to do for the next target it, depending on what happens you know there you go that's really they're all nice. all there is to it it sounds pretty simple but it takes a very long time to to be able to do that in seconds you know that's what separates oh uh, yeah from everybody else You've got well to be able it's to easy make to melt down seconds. So. oh yeah it's easy to melt down on, on the clock you know it because uh you well first of all i mean you got to see it and that's that's half the battle you know like uh a lot of times you uh some people don't don't see it or whatever and then you get nervous and then you don't know what to do so uh, instead of instead of making a good uh like an educated guess a lot of people just do the same thing again and then if they see it then they make a, a correction uh instead of going well none of those things work that was just on the plate so why don't we try something different uh you know it's just like little it's things like that anything. what's that is, it's the old insanity thing insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results yeah like, yeah why didn't it work <laughs> <laughs> yeah what why didn't uh this target's half mil wide and i just i just held left edge so obviously nothing from zero to a half mil worked so it must be more or it's got to be the other direction so if you look at the mirage real fast in your scope you know you you know like if the mirage is going if you held left edge and the mirage is going left to right that that it's that the first half mil of your reticle ain't working so you know it's got to be the next half mil so if you put half mil inside the left edge you're probably going to hit the target mm -hmm. but you might maybe you don't maybe you need even more than that but most of the time people don't get that far off so what you just said it makes perfect sense and i don't think i've ever heard that explained so simply and clearly like that's excellent advice for, for new shooters right there because you know everyone's like well you know if you gotta hold more or less duh but that was that was like some good textbook level stuff there like was... well most people what i notice especially newer guys everybody wants to hold center it's real easy to hold center and so i think i think sometimes uh you got to kind of get away from that because it's rarely do you ever hold center and then what most people do is if wind's left or right in that scenario, they would just go, because most people have a two-tenths uh, mil reticle, they just go from holding. So that was three-tenths, or yeah, you that was like a quarter. You basically held left edge. So you're t essentially holding quarter mil to the middle. Uh, but now they just go, okay, my reticle was about on the two-tenths in the middle. They just go to holding four-tenths in the middle. Because you only want to move, you, nobody wants to move a lot. You just want to move a little bit. You just want to make these little half corrections. But if, if people would go, okay, uh, a lot of times I go, what's, what size is that target? Half mil. I take a tenth off of it just in the off chance that, the, the, that it was a little bit of elevation. You're still going to catch an edge. So I go, if it's a half mil plate, take a tenth off that and move move my basically move my half mil mark inside the left edge and so basically i just move four tenths and now I, now now i'm gonna pull the trigger and that's gonna give me the most like statistically if i didn't see a damn thing that's gonna give me the most uh the highest probability of hitting the target yeah it took me like five years to figure that out morgan so uh it took me a long time to figure out but you're exactly correct most people under correct they don't think about the width of the target. And uh, so, yeah, it took me a very long time to figure that out and uh, a, lot, a lot of time and a lot of money. So congratulations yeah. on being a lot smarter than I was. <laughs> well, well, it, you know, you just, I don't know. It's just li little things like that go a long ways. And then if you do see it, uh, the other thing I also see is guys will see it. They just see dust on the side of a plate instead of taking the time to measure where it was at. 
they just still only had two tenths instead of just like stopping and going, where was my, what did I hold last time? I held four tenths. Okay. Put four tenths in the middle of the plate and then read over. Okay. I need nine tenths and then go all the way over nine tenths in the middle of the plate, pull the trigger. Now, now you hit dead center instead of hitting nowhere now still hitting right, right of the target or, or hit, catching an edge or something. Yeah, going from left edge to favor left with their correction, you know, so. Yep. All right, while we're on the topic of like good information, um, one of the things that we're going to try and do now that we have somebody experienced amongst us like Paul um, that's been around and had a bunch of questions asked of him over the years um, is kind of do some how-tos, a little bit of, informational type stuff so paul made a video earlier today on one of the questions that he's asked most as a gunsmith um so i'm going to go ahead and pull this up and let us watch this real quick to go into a little bit of good information on barrel breaking except for my computer just did exactly what it wasn't supposed to there we go oh there we go all right today we're going to answer the most asked question in rifle building other than when is my rifle going to be ready? And that is on barrel breaking. In front of me, I've got an 80 grit piece of sandpaper that's extremely rough. And I've got a 320 degree, a 320 grit sandpaper that's not rough. It's very smooth. I take this bar of soap and I rub it on this 320 grit. I rub it on this 80 grit. The roughness of this 80 grit is going to retain a lot more of the soap than this 320. Okay. All of these little ridges in here are going to get filled in with soap. And that's exactly what happens when you have something like a factory Remington barrel. If you ever look down a Remington barrel with a bore scope, you would honestly wonder how the bullet comes out the other end. They are that rough and, and machining is that bad. So those barrels are going to build up copper very quickly. Now we want that copper to smooth the surface out. We want those little indentations filled in with copper. But beyond that, we don't want any more copper, and you're going to have an excess of copper build up in there when that barrel is new. Uh, this being more like a Krieger or a part line barrel, micro polished, you're not going to have much copper build up. So the break in procedure for these two barrels is completely different because this barrel really isn't going to retain a lot of copper. It's going to the copper in a Krieger or part line barrel, it's going to fill in micro imperfections in it. But there are very few of those, and it's not going to take very long for that to happen. The Remington barrel, if you go in there and you shoot 50 rounds through it, and then you clean all the copper back out of it, all that's happened is you've smoothed some of the machine marks down with the bullet going through the barrel, and then you've got to go back in and fill them all in and get the copper. So you don't want to remove all the copper out of the barrel. You want to remove all of the excess copper out of the barrel. Uh, so for one of these rough Remington barrels, you may want to clean it after the first five rounds because it's going to it's going to pick up a lot of brass after five. Oh, I'm sorry, a lot of copper after five rounds. Um, it's a completely different animal. You're going to need to clean it, you know, every ten to fifteen to twenty rounds, probably for the first hundred rounds. Those bullets are smooth on the inside of that barrel, and that copper's filling in those those imperfections. But that's going to take a great deal more time, and it's going to take with a Krieger or a Bart line or something that's been micro polished, which basically shoots almost the same new as it will after 150 rounds. It's going to seal a little bit. You're going to get that jump up in velocity. But uh, beyond that, a Krieger or Bart line will shoot just as accurately with a brand new as they will uh, any other time. I've, I've had some phenomenal groups in the first 10 rounds out of my rifles. So the velocity may change, but I haven't seen the accuracy change. It's, it's going to be pretty darn good. So on something like a really rough Remington barrel, uh, you're gonna to wanna to use a case neck brush and never put a metallic brush down a barrel. I always use a nylon case neck brush. Uh, just use some hops number nine, a couple of wet patches, run the case neck brush up and down 10 times, a couple more wet patches, and then uh, some dry patches. Never put a bullet down a barrel that's got any type of oil or liquid in it, any, anything. It's, it's not gonna compress. So. Hopefully this clears up a little bit as to why there's not one answer to barrel breaking. You're going to want to really be careful with a Remington or a, an otherwise factory barrel that's got a lot of machining marks in it. It's going to take a much longer time for that 
barrel to fill in the spots, fill in all the imperfections, smooth out the inside as the bullet goes down through it, and eventually kind of reach a point of equilibrium where it's got the proper amount of copper in it. And uh, after that, you know, life will be good, but it's gonna take, uh, you know, you're gonna to need to clean it every 15 to 20 rounds, probably for the first 100 rounds to get that to happen on a, like a factory run to the barrel. Uh, these here on a Krieger bar line, I tell my customers shoot 50 rounds to it, clean it. After that, I don't worry about it. And I clean it about every 400 rounds. Hopefully this answers a question that has been argued way too much on the internet. From PMAC Precision, we'll see you next time. All right, back to. Awesome. So we're going to start having some little tips here and there throughout the show, little gems, little nuggets of information. I'm looking forward to that. Next, next time I'm going to do uh, ballistics. I'm going to explain how you can not only memorize your own ballistics easily, but how you can really pretty much memorize everybody's ballistics. My, my students, when I teach a class, are always amazed that I pretty well know everybody's ballistics, no matter what caliber they're shooting. And it's really not that difficult to do once you understand how I go about it. So we're going to go through that next week and uh, explain to people how to really understand their ballistics and uh, even use it as a diagnostic tool to some degree. Do you, uh, do you use like a certain method where you add like say seven tenths after so far? You're, you're kind of on the right track. I, I memorized this, what I call the split. So for yeah, that's, six, that's more, what I'm thinking. For, for a six creed more um, from say out to 400 yards, it's gonna be about, let, let's just say 0.2 for every 25 yards or something. And then yep. after 500 to 900, it's gonna be about 0.3 or whatever. Ever, yep. ever. And so once you memorize that, and then you go, okay, well, a 308 is typically about three tenths per 100 yards more, or, or three tenths per 25 yards more than a six creed more is. So, you, you really, really quickly in your head can start to, to pop off, you know, uh, ballistics for different calibers that are really close. Plus, you know, a six Creedmoor and a 300 wind mag are almost identical ballistics if you look at, uh, you know, to a certain point. Uh, so there's some of that too, but I'll go through that next week and uh, we'll get into that. And I'll hopefully take some of the, some of the mystery out of, uh, it's, you know, it's one thing to, to understand your ballistics. It's another thing to really know how to manipulate them on the fly so that if you have a problem uh, on a stage or something and to say your card falls off and you can't find it, uh, you shouldn't really have any trouble knowing what your ballistics are for the next two or three targets if you, if you follow my system. And it's not my system. There's, I'm sure 90% of the yeah. people do the idea. So. Awesome. Greg, do we have any live stuff? Yeah, we do. Okay. Yeah, we got uh, lots of lives. Uh, Swanee said the barrel break in for a Remington barrel is to take it off and throw it in the garbage. Swanee is correct, as usual. <laughs> um, guys calling each other dreamy. Um, yeah, why do you guys do that? It's weird. Uh, hey, they're all going to be they're all going to be wearing dresses this weekend. All right, so that's going to yeah. be even weirder. Um. 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 Swanee also wants to know, Morgan, what do you do when you don't load enough ammo in your max? Yeah, well, I, I hope you got enough in one of them. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, shoot, if you got six in one, then you just run out, throw the next one in. That's that's exactly I Honestly, I've only done that once in the last couple of years. And uh, it was actually, I won the match. It was uh, the one that Paul was talking about, that PRS Idaho match. Uh, that was an arrow match this year. Um, yeah, it went about five weeks ago or something. And troop line, I for some reason only had eight in the mag. I mean, first time that's happened in two years, like I say. But that's why I packed the extra mag, popped that mag out, threw the next mag, mag in, finished the stage. I'm I'm gonna one up you. I, I'll tell you what it took me. It was it wasn't until the last few years I shot, but when I had a prone stage where I wasn't gonna be moving. And a troop line type stage, I would actually take an extra magazine and set it right beside the rifle, right beside the mag well, so that if I had a malfunction, it was faster to pop the old mag out, let the round drop and put the new mag in than it is to actually clear, try to clear a yep. malfunction. Yep. I, no, never, I never really needed it, 
but it, it surprised me that I didn't think of that. I, I'm not that bright a guy. It took me, like I said, it took me a lot of years to figure a lot of this stuff out, but uh, that's kind of along the same lines as you, you know, having, having a plan, you know, I'm a retired fire department captain. We always had a plan A and a plan B and a plan C because oftentimes plan A got thrown out the window pretty quick. And that's kind of the way shooting is, you know, you, that's where you're really, I think doing one of the reasons you're doing so well, because you, you kind of have that concept down is that you, you, you got to have a plan A, but your plan B needs to be almost as good. And you need to know exactly what it's going to be and how to implement it. So congratulations again, man. You're way ahead of the game for a guy your age and no longer than you've been doing this. Oh, I appreciate it. Uh, that was one thing I forgot to, to, I guess, to also to Swanee's point and part of my mental approach is I usually always, when I walk up to a stage, um, if it's a 12 round stage, uh, I have standard. So I run AWs almost all the time. So I pop my mag out of my gun. Like I'll put, I like put it in and then they'll actually ready. And sometimes I'll pop it back out. But most of the time, always before I, if I haven't already, I always pull them out. I love the, I love the, uh, aw mags because i can i can turn it turn it a little bit to the left and i can see all the bullets all the way down i can count one two three four five and i can turn it the other way go one two three four five down the other side and i know i got 10 rounds in that mag and then the other thing i do is on a 12 round stage i usually i always load that i that i have that 12 round mag and the 12 round mag gets loaded with 12 rounds and then i got and i usually pack two aws sometimes three aws whatever and then uh but that 12 round mag if I know I'm coming up on a 12 round stage, a couple shooters before me, I will dump all the rounds out of it onto my pack and I'll count them on the way out and then I'll count them on the way back in. So I know I got 12 rounds. One thing I did on my a standard single stack mag is I actually took a small drill bit and I drilled a hole down at the bottom of the mag where the, where the 10th round showed. So I could see, you know, that there was 10 rounds in there because I, I was scared to death of that, that. Yep. Me too. You can't give away points. I mean, I've tried to explain to people that in a normal match, every point you lose is five spots. In the in the you know like the gap grind where there's 400 people, every spot you lose is probably 15 or 20 spots. So you know, little things like that that most people that's where people again your background with attention to detail has really helped you out a lot. So congratulations. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I've. Uh... I have lots of very long to-do lists and some of the stuff is like way overdue, but like the, the drill in the hole in the mags, that's something that like for the last year I've been like, Oh yeah, when am I going to get around to doing that and just never have, um, I'll take my, I'll pull out my flashlight and I can look down the front of my AI mags and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, 12 gets a little, I can't really count to 12. So it's at least with my shoes on. So that gets a little run out of but I could get fingers. to 10. Yeah. Um, Let's see. We had a good live. Uh, Rudy wants to know what does your training routine look like? Mine? Yeah. Uh, I do a lot of uh, a lot of one shot drills and two shot drills. I break everything down. I don't I don't like to run stages. That's just my personal preference. Some guys do. Some guys do whatever. But I just I break everything down and I go ultra slow. Um. So I just, I overemphasize everything. So uh, in order to do it perfect, you can't do things perfect fast until you've done them, done them perfect slow a thousand times. And then, and then you have to, and then you slowly increase it into where you can do things perfect fast. And then it doesn't feel fast. I think it's really cute that you asked, oh, you want to know my training schedule? They don't want to know mine. Craig's <laughs> we suck. <laughs> Yeah, again, again, you've got that exactly right. You, you, no matter what you're trying to perfect, you're trying to operate at a subconscious level. You know, I was never thinking about putting my rifle on a barricade. I was thinking about the wind. I put my rifle on a barricade nine million times. I didn't have to think about that anymore. And that's, that's where I think a, a lot of people get lost is they don't understand that if you're thinking about shooting when you're shooting, you're, you're way behind the curve. All you should be thinking about is, is the wind. You shouldn't be thinking about the, the barricade or the bag or, or how you're going to pull your trigger all that stuff should all be on autopilot so it just takes a lot of repetitions to get that done and i was going to ask you if you if you ever worried about time because i did it exactly the way you did it i went slow and i went perfect but then when i needed to be fast i had no trouble being fast so you know you again Speed you is kind of figured all this stuff out and i think that rodeo is probably it's the exact same way that you learned to to, to win at rodeo yeah, I think speed 
is one of those things I've never been, I've never had a problem with it, but that's just cause I don't know if I got to go fast. Some, I mean, I got that theory, like, uh, I don't know. I kind of lived or died by it, but, uh, I feel like if there's lead in the air, there's hope. So, <laughs> so, so if it comes down to it, it's like, I'm, I'm sending them. So that's just how, that's how it is. I mean, uh, but, um, but I, I usually, I, <clears throat> I mean, I've shot enough now and I run a shot timer like all the time when I'm practicing. So <clears throat> I kind of know my cadence and I know where I'm at. And I, <clears throat> I actually, I actually do think about my trigger because I do feel like good trigger mechanics is, is it, it, it usually is not a subconscious uh, a thing because a lot of times it's uh, it, it is one of those things where it does need a conscious input. So it's like, you gotta, um, <clears throat> I, so what I do is I'll be, I'll be thinking about the wind and then uh, I'll actually switch as soon as my finger touches the trigger, all of a sudden I, I, there's a transition in my brain to where all of a sudden now I I'm touching the trigger. So now I'm thinking about my trigger and I just think squeeze. And I slowly add pressure till the gun goes off, regardless of the wobble. And then I watch the bullet hit, and then we're back to wind mode. Interesting way to break it down. Is there one skill particularly that you are working on right now to refine your shooting? I mean, you're already an amazing shooter, but is there one thing that you're like, I'm really trying to improve on this? Yeah. I So even I don't care what, what match I leave, if I won the match or if I, like, lost by – thousand points i i uh i usually sit down and make make some time and i i i I have a note on my my ipad and i'll sit down there and i'll take 10 15 minutes and i write down what i think the good things i did and the bad things and i it uh or what i think i need to work on or theories running theories that i have like oh, oh what what happened here like if i've got question marks you know like why did I, why did this happen? Or why did this happen? I'll end up calling people and saying, Hey, what do you think? So let me tell you this. And, and what do you think about this? And so that I can figure that out and figure out what, what happened here, what happened there. And, uh, so that, so that I, I gain experience. Cause you know, you go to these different places, different ranges all over the place and you'll see things like you'll, you go, you come out here, and shoot up canyons and stuff and you're going to see updrafts and if you're from back east and never seen an updraft before you're going to be like why is my dope off and you're going to like you're going to drive yourself insane trying to figure that out until you just realize forget about it just shave just shave your dope and then yeah oh yeah that that, yeah that's a thing and then you'll get eaten live if you if you're from out here and go back to georgia and shoot out there and and don't start shaving when you see mirage because you're shooting over top of stuff. So, uh, there's all those little things like that. And so I try to, I try to keep track of that. So, but right now to answer your question after I ramble is, uh, that I, I've been really thinking about, um, trying to figure out how to make corrections based, like to stay real time. So, uh, our, our, or in the moment, shall I say, where a lot of times I get tunnel vision when I'm shooting to where you could yell at me, you could throw rocks at me, do whatever, and I, you couldn't, you couldn't get my attention because all I'm thinking about is squeezing the trigger and seeing what the bullet hits. But I'm trying to figure out how to take, be able to do that, but also um, be able to be situationally aware of like my the conditions and and make little tiny, um, little tiny. Uh, adjustments based off of what i'm feeling and what i'm seeing in my scope that i that i haven't been able to do because i'm so just locked into just this one thing of just pulling trigger and seeing a bullet go down range and making a correction off the bullet it's hard to make a correction off off of the bullet and then but then be like oh wait i feel something else and then make it and then do something different or take a correction or take a or take a a uh, something that you just hit dead center with and then change it because based off something you just felt or saw so that's what i'm working on right now you know the first the first year i went to washington state was the first year that they had the match in washington state there south of spokane and they had the targets up on the side of that mountain over there and they were you know a part of good ways and of course all us guys from the east showed up and 
So we're trying to do what we always do. We, we shoot at target one and we take the information from target one and we try to apply that to target two. And Morgan, I'm not kidding. When those guys were just looking at us like, you guys are just idiots. It doesn't work here. Target one has nothing to do with target two. It's on a different hill. And they thought we were, you know, they were just laughing at us, literally. And uh, so you guys, y'all got a special set of skills up there that uh, we don't have down here in the southeastern part of the United States. It's definitely, uh, it can be something. It's something. Well, it's like, it's a weird deal because, you know, that, that works a lot of times. But then sometimes you got to be a little, be able to see, like I'm looking at a hillside right now and because I'm at my range and it's like, uh, you know, you, I got a couple of canyons over and yeah, every canyon might have a different deal going on in it. To be able to be able to read that sometimes can be a little bit tricky. I don't know how to do it all the time. I just, sometimes you just, I was say, you it spray be, and pray. It could be three separate stages all, in, all inside of one. You know, when, oh, yeah. you shoot, when, oh, when yeah. literally, you know, you shoot there and then shoot there and it's just totally different environments. Yeah, I can remember a stage in Washington where I held zero wind for the first target, a half mil for the second target, and three mils for the third target. So that's, that's how much difference there was going up the side of a mountain, and it was just beyond our comprehension coming from down here, you know. Yeah. I'm going to hit a couple lives real quick. Uh, Francis wants to know what your secret to keeping your shirts wrinkle-free and dust-free after laying in the Oklahoma dust. Starch, baby. <laughs> Lots of stuff, and that's uh, right. Bradley wants to know how much you like snakes. Let's not talk about that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I feel like there's a story here. Nope, no stories. I don't know what the hell you guys are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna be a vet. You have to like snakes. I mean, yeah, snakes. no, you don't. Best snake. Yeah, well, it's fine. <laughs> Best snake, a dead snake. Not gonna no, I didn't say anything. Now you need to tell this story. <coughs> no, I, I don't I don't know what story he's referring to exactly, but uh, yeah, I think it's a well known fact. I do not like them things. I'm with you. I just it's just not a not a good deal. No, nope. this weekend there was a big old bull snake up there in Idaho, and I was first, and all of a sudden on this stage, and uh, and. I, I seen it back there and I was just like and somebody said something about it and Matt Allwine he thinks he's pretty funny um and I've traveled with him some and well quite a bit and and the Utah when we were shooting out here he he thought it'd be real funny so he found a little bull snake and it was pretty nice and so he picked it up and took it over to me and I, I'm not I'm you know had no idea and then all of a sudden <clears throat> that thing's sitting next to me and uh I feel something touch my foot and I freaked out i thought i was gonna kill somebody <laughs> i mean it was bad so then this weekend i'm having like freaking uh uh ptsd from that that situation thinking somebody's gonna be setting that thing down to my pack i'm like every time i'd sit on zip my pack i'd kind of get back and check things make sure like nothing's underneath my pack nothing's around it i'm like you guys are a-holes they're like oh you're you're fine you've already got a 10 point lead I'm like, whatever, that thing can disappear with one snake. <laughs> I, I feel like Jennifer would legitimately shoot somebody if they did that. I told somebody this weekend I would. Yeah, I probably would. I'm not a fan. Uh, at uh, Was it at Pig River that we were that a mouse ran up my leg? Yep. A little field mouse. And Ryan Allison just like reached over and grabbed it and took it off my leg. I was like, oh. yeah, I don't like snakes, though that's crazy i don't i'm not a fan either so yeah, there ain't no there's just no reason yep what else you got greg not good uh francis wants to know what kind of starch <laughs> francis you gonna start wearing collard uh so you know that there's a, it comes in a red tub or not or not a red tub a yellow tub with like a blue writing on it i can't remember the name of it but you get it at the grocery store it's pretty easy to come by you, you make it there's, there's plenty of recipes for the mixture or my favorite kind dry cleaners, dry cleaners. I, I like that one yeah yeah 
it works good. It's good on your pants. They actually, if most places, if you go there, you got to say, if you want your pants done right, you got to say cowboy starch because there's heavy, extra heavy starch ain't extra heavy starch. It's cowboy starch. And that's when they make it cardboard stiff. And that's how you, oh yeah. That's oh, how you like your pants. That's classy right there. You want to look good, get your pants starched, get your shirt. See, I like my shirts like just like kind of medium to just low, just just light starch or whatever. Because, you know, you don't need a lot of starch on your shirts, but your pants, you got to have that crease. I'm going to go take my, my holy car hearts and get them cowboy starched. That's right. You... You might not like it at first, but you look in the mirror and you're like what you see. <laughs> Very solid holes in my pants. <laughs> the girls like it, don't they, Morgan? The girls like the starch. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's yeah. it's just a cowboy thing. Oh yeah, they do. Yeah, that's my, my wife loves it. She she if, if she would take my pants to this to the dry cleaners every time if I let her. I mean, not just because of the washing. She would she would prefer. Like, if she could wash them and starch them like that, she would. I wonder if there's, like, training but classes for that. I think there is. She worked at the dry cleaners for a while. She should know how to do it. I say she, she should know needs, then. I know, but, you know, you got to have a nice press. They got to have these big presses. You can do it. You just got to get, like, say, you got to get the right mixture of starch. And then and it, there's an art to it. I'm telling you. you, you got, a guy goes through a few uh, – Dry cleaners getting his pants right when you know you got to make sure your pants are good. It's important. It is a big deal. I could uh, yeah. I could see you in the future just like having this giant pants press in like some special room in your house. No, never. I never see this happening to me. <laughs> I see the dry cleaners being a big big part of my life, and I I supporting them wholeheartedly. <laughs> that's funny um so how is vet school going um how much longer you got until you're a, a full-on vet i just finished my first year and it's a four-year school so four-year graduate school and then i'll do a year internship so i got i got three years left of school but it's going good i mean it's busy it's uh pretty intense they, they uh they don't uh they don't slow down for nobody or anything they don't so rifle matches do they no they don't they do not that's uh uh you know that's what i mean that Aaron Earl finale got pretty tight there he just i had an anatomy final which is pretty intense uh on friday and i had a phys or a pathology test on monday when i got back so i basically landed i studied on the plane both both there and back and landed and stayed up all night studying just because I, I mean i've been studying for two weeks for them tests and for three weeks for them tests and then uh you know figured i'd better make sure i'm ready to go and then i had a day off and then we had three more right in a row uh that week so it was kind of intense but made it through and on to the next one that's pretty awesome so what's your favorite series to compete in? Because you shoot it all. I mean, and you just won the NRL, but PRS, you're not doing too shabby either. I believe you're in first in the PRS run right now, the points race. Yeah, just got just got finished off 300 just this weekend. So I think I'm doing all right now. But, I, uh, you know, so, like, I – I think they're all like you go to an NRL match, you go to a PRS match. The feel is very similar. Like the style of shooting, same. The The big thing is, is, you know, you, if you go to an NRL match, you're basically, you're competing against half the guys. So like you, the match, so to, to win one, when you're at a, a match, same level of difficulty because you're going to have the same guys in the same location but um as soon as um at, at the prs matches you know you fly out fly out east and big matches them or i don't know it's it's the it's everybody you know so i i do like that about it 
So, yeah, I, I mean, the PRS finale is huge. So I, I definitely that's that's my next deal. I, I want to win that pretty bad. So I'm hungry. You're hungry for it, huh? That's right. So, I, yeah, favorite, I don't know that there's a favorite, but definitely, definitely like them both. But, can you, pick? you know, huh? I, I know, but if I'm picking right now, it's, it's, it's got to be PRS because I won the NRL. And so now it's like, okay, I got to win the PRS. So, that would that's be the absolutely next step. legendary to do in the same year. Well, that's the plan. So I guess yeah, I mean, I guess I want to win all three, right? Just AG Cup, NRL, PRS, do it all. That would be cool if you won all three. And that would be really cool. I caught in golf the uh, oh, triple crown. Yeah, well, that's the horse racing, but in golf they have where they win so many majors. It's something too. I can't remember. But yeah, it'd be like the triple crown. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you, you know, there's a lot of good guys out there and it'd be a heck of a thing to do because uh, there's just some really dominant guys in this game. But I would really like to I mean, every, I, mean I think everybody's got that goal, you know, it, it, they wouldn't or they wouldn't be the top guys. Hey, uh, if they if they didn't, they wouldn't be the top guys. I should say. Our uh, resident golf expert, Francis, said it's called the Grand Slam. Okay, there, there you go. go. He does know something so, about golf. Let's, let's do it. Grand Slam. Yeah, he does, I guess. Golf shop <laughs> guy. Yes, I mean, that's part of his livelihood. So. Like what he does for a living. All I do is not the things. Not anymore. Not anymore. Ballistics huh? R Us is, is Francis. He works for Applied Ballistics now. He does. Did yeah, not that's, know that. that's his deal. That's what I'm saying. Ballistics R Us. Francis Cologne. Huh. I want one of those jackets, Francis. That's your friend. I mean, I mean, I'm sure he'll comment on there and say if I'm right or wrong, but I think I'm pretty. I think I'm right. He said, "Ex golf pro." See, told you. So where did this go? Um, Mike Sanowski played a lot of golf too. He said, "Do you notice when cycles?" in common intervals between larger gusts and slack times that matches on either coast? Maybe I don't understand that question. Like, do you notice that, do you ever see where it's like eight mile an hour wind for 30 seconds and then 12 mile an hour wind for five seconds and then just repeat that cycle back and forth, I guess? Oh, yeah, usually maybe. not. I usually see because you might feel that where you're standing. And, and if you're feeling that and that's consistent, what's happening is you're feeling you're you might feel it that way and you might perceive it that way. But go look in your go look in your glass. And if you can see it, catch a hillside with with just straight green grass across it, you're going to see that grass going waves. And that's what that water it, it, it's kind of like watching the ocean uh like roll in the tide like just kind of waves coming in but the average velocity across that distance usually is going to be this pretty, pretty constant you're going to get gusts and you're going to get lulls in it but a lot of times it's going to average out over the over the distance always go back to your average if you get lost you yep. always go back to your average that's right. Yep. So what uh, what matches um, do you have coming up, Morgan? And I it's gonna be busy here. I got so this weekend I'm gonna do uh I'm gonna RO. I got kind of talked into RO in a uh, NRL hunter match. Convenient thing about that thing is I get to shoot the whole thing too. So it's uh I'm being selfishly selfless selfless. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go up there, shoot it all on Friday, and then RO um, the next two days that match, and then um, then I'm gonna go to K and M the week after that, be there, and then 
And then there's a NRL match out here. My buddy's put it on. But it's only two hours from the house three, or three hours from the house. Going to go to go to that one, and then um, then I'm then the next one after that. I may have a week off. I don't know. Uh, week but then off. I got yeah, that might be crazy. That's like something I don't usually do, but probably not. And then I'm going to go. There's a New Mexico match. Um, it's got they got an antelope hunt on the table, so of course I'm going. And then, uh, then P- Hornady PRC, maybe can't, maybe the Punisher position. I haven't decided on that one just yet. Oh, and the Colorado, uh, Doug Koenig and, uh, and Keith Baker putting on this matching in Colorado, going to that one too. That's kind of mixed in there somewhere too. So, and then, uh, I'll end up going to the Washington or the Wisconsin bar- barrel maker. And yeah, that's like the next two months. So it's going to be still. What? What's that? I don't think you're ever the type to sit still. No, no. uh, I can't stand just like sitting at home doing or like being just home. I got to go do something. Uh, Yeah, I got I got it kind of the next little while planned out. I usually do. I usually sit down and plan. I'll have all the matches. I got them all color coded in my in a Google calendar. So mm-hmm. I can just sit down and just like, these are the ones I'm going to. These are this weekend. These are this weekend. These are this weekend. And I have them all lined up, start buying flights and start just going to town. That's so, awesome. What lives do we have? Um, no, no new ones, really. No new lives. Francis said, if you ever watched him shoot, he doesn't ever sit still. <laughs> Well, you know me. <laughs> Guess if you know, you know, right? Mm-hmm. Definitely doesn't sit still. Um, no, I'm kind of all over the place. That's good, though. I think it helps. I think your energy is what helps you shoot so fast and all. Way yeah, more yeah. if you reload your own ammo. Uh, yes, sir. I do. I, I, I'm fast, though. Uh, it's all about speed. You're faster than that, too. <laughs> A hundred percent. That's how I do it. It's just, uh, you know, with what you got, we run, we're running six BR, run alpha brass, burger bullets. Uh, it's hard to screw it up. So, and honestly, uh, well, uh, yeah. So I just, I run a progress, I run a Hornady progressive. Um, I, and I, and I also, I size everything on a single stage rock checker with a quick eject system. And a and I and I run the uh, Micron, which I don't know if you guys have ever used the Micron die that uh, Bullet Central makes, but that thing is pretty sweet. It's like nitrided, so it's like it like your nothing sticks in there. It's really smooth. Um, you and you, uh, anyways. I just hurry and lube my brass up when I get home. I size everything real fast, throw it all in the tumbler, and then it tumbles overnight or whatever. Pull it out, and then uh, it goes. Usually, uh, a, a chamfer off of my trimming will last a couple firing, so I won't worry about that. I don't, I don't anneal because really ain't nobody got time for that. So, <laughs> and it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make any difference, honestly. I, I've checked it, talked to Alpha about it, and I'm not gonna say that that it might help some guys or whatever, but uh, I feel like as long as you're getting consistent seating, then it doesn't matter. And, and I've ran brass to 25 plus firings without annealing. So I don't really care. Uh, big thing is, is making sure there is a chamfer in there. So I'll, I'll run them through my Gerard real fast, make sure there's a, uh, chamfer on the inside of the neck, throw it in my case feeder. And I got two A and D sitting right next to each other. And I run a decapping die in the first position on my, my, uh, progressive. And I load the primer thing up, and then I on the second position I have a uh, I have a mandrel. <laughs> she died on the mandrel. I have that reloading process got him. That's right. Twenty five reloadings with no annealing. That's man. He has more energy than his. That phone. scares me to death to just hear him talk about how he's doing his reloading. <laughs> I 
He's super fast. Yeah, I'm sitting here like I got this Dylan 650 that like <laughs> Francis said that's funny right there. Morgan is speechless. <laughs> <laughs> he stopped for once. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he didn't stop. We just can't see him. He's still probably talking. Oh. Yeah, he went out. So I don't know if his phone died or what, but let's see. We 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 could keep we could hang out for for another couple of minutes. See if he he was at the range. So yep. We can start doing some shout outs while we're waiting, and then if he comes back, we'll finish chatting. So Greg, why don't you do the shout out? All right. So I'm gonna start out shouting out to our. Uh, our youngest TSM fan ever, Addison Wink, who was born today. Um, yeah. Prentice's little baby. She's a lot cuter than him. A lot. <laughs> but congratulations, y'all. Um, GSL Suppressors. Takes my little 22, like super, super quiet. I love it. Um, shooters and Sharpshooters of Augusta, our local. Sorry. Inborn. Hey, Morgan's back. Oop, I hear yeah, him. Yeah, I don't know what the heck just happened right there. I don't know. Francis Sorry. said, wow, he phone... stopped for once. Yeah, I, it, my phone tweaked out on me, but I don't know if, if I'm interrupting you now. We were Sorry just about that. talking so that people didn't leave us. Um, oh. Sorry. We lost you uh, on yeah. uh, the second stage is the mandrel, I think. Yeah, second stage is a ma mandrel, die, mandrel die, and then I have a blank a blank station a funnel die and then a seating die and i prime on it and i just literally i drop the ram and uh i i take a powder cup off of my my uh my a and d one of the a and d's that's usually one of them is stopped while while i'm doing this i throw a powder in there put it back on there and then start lifting the ram grab a bullet set it on top of it and then push it forward and it kicks the kicks a loaded one out and it it uh and then i prime one and then repeat and you just do that a bunch of times and pretty soon you're done it doesn't take very it doesn't take very long because it's just it's fa as fast as those a and d's can can go um the two of them which is pretty fast uh you can load all your ammo uh as long as you don't get too distracted um you can just load it pretty fast I, I i the only reason i got the decapper in that first deal is because i don't like going through every case and making sure there's no media in there i just throw the decapper in and it just kicks it out automatically smart i like it it's like i have this thing sitting here that has not been yep. used in probably three years one day yeah, the only thing on those is you got to make sure you get the shim kit or whatever to make sure that head doesn't rock on you if you're going to load precision rifle stuff. The Hornady doesn't have that um, um, issue, but, you know, for, for precision rifle, that thing's – the Hornady works really good, but those Dillons are pretty dang sweet too. Yeah, for, for loading pistol, I love that thing. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're amazing for that. That's mm – -hmm. they shine there. But I've shot so much pistol over the last three years that I haven't had to pull the handle on it once. <laughs> yeah. Any more lives? Um, let me go over to the live screen. I think we are good. Well, I think we'll go back to shout outs then. All right. Um, where was I? PDC Custom, most beautiful rifle chassis ever. Uh, Shooter's World Propellant, Fix It Sticks, and Vortec. Sweet. Oh, you got any shout outs? Me? Uh, I probably ought to thank my wife for getting this computer up and running. I would probably never figure out how to do this. Um, and for generally putting up with me and, uh, you know. I'm not the easiest guy in the world to live with. I say, I'm like an old version of Morgan. I'm always doing something. I just finished restoring a 1965 Brunswick tournament pool table. It took me three weeks. Um, you know, I've always got some project going on. So she puts up with all that. And uh, my scars, I was, I was telling them earlier that I've, last week, I've 
hit one of my fingers with a hammer and uh, ground one of my knuckles down to the bone with a hand grinder. So uh, it's uh, it's always interesting, you know. So it's not it's not easy being uh, housed with me. Uh, you get pretty good at first aid. That, that probably wasn't your brightest moment, Paul. No, just not at all. Morgan, you got any shout outs? Oh, I probably better thank my wife too. I mean, uh, Paul would un or Paul's wife would understand, I guess. It's just, she's, we got a little kid. He's, he's, uh, 16 months now and he's crazy. And she, she makes sure everything's good. So when I show up to a match, all I got to think about is let's shoot this stage. I don't have to think about what's going on at home because it's taken care of and she's, she's amazing for that. And thanks that, you know, I've been fortunate, uh, like, like Paul alluded to earlier, I kind of came out of nowhere this last year because, this was definitely not my first, my first uh, sport, shall we say. It was kind of the place I would go blow off steam. Um, so you know, I would go to some some of the local um, bigger matches and a lot of the local series matches. But then I'd just focus on rodeo the rest of the time, and and uh, so I kind of came out of nowhere. And uh, you know, some people have some of some companies have picked me up, like Leopold and Masterpiece Arms. Dix and Andy, uh, I know I'm going to forget a lot of people. Uh, Lone Peak Arms, Priest Precision, um, Armageddon Gear, Alpha Munitions. Uh, those guys, they, they've made going to matches and being able to, you know, come up with components and, and uh, you know, come up with the good equipment that runs and helps me be able to compete at a high level. You know, it's – those guys make the best stuff in the game. And I've been just fortunate just to be able to kind of ride off their coattails and it's been working pretty good. So I'll just keep doing it. Well, congratulations on your success. The only thing that you've said this whole evening that scares me is the uh, 25 times reloading the brass without a kneeling. And I'm sure I'm not the only guy that took notice of that. I don't think you'll have any of your fellow competitors standing too near to you while you're actually down on the stage firing. They're going to want some well, play between you and the gun, I promise you. So uh, I just, don't – Just keep, hey, it's working. You can't argue with success. There's, there's no wrong yeah, way. Yeah, I, I don't advise it, uh, but, uh, <laughs> really? you know, so so what happens is is uh, I get to around 18 firings, and then I just got to start uh, watching them all. And then I'll, you'll still see me, and I'll, like, pull up my brass. And before I throw up my brass bag, I just, like, go through every one of them and make sure they're good. And then I'll be chucking two or three of them or whatever. But most of the time I don't, I don't ever get to that. And anymore, like say, uh, alpha munitions has been pretty good to me. And I've talked to them a lot about this because they are like, we've done all the testing and they're like, you can anneal, you can not anneal. It doesn't really matter on this stuff. So I'm like, okay, well then that just helps me. Uh, but don't, don't take my word for that. I don't advise it. Like definitely definitely do a kneel if you got the time and whatever but uh I, I mean right now i'm running all virgin so uh i have to get through all my virgin which i'll be through it here pretty quick and then i i've got once sized and and it and yeah a few firings you're you're totally fine though well you know that's why i ran nozzler brass and 6xc for a while because i could buy the nozzler brass it was so good i could put a primer in it powder and a bullet i didn't touch it no chamfer, no nothing. And I would run it two or three firings and then I would just go get more new nozzle brass because it was so much faster. It saved me so much time just buying that new brass, put powder in it, put a primer in it, and you're done. And the I only said, thing I – oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, that's, that's it. I said the only thing I'd go, I do now with my alpha when I get it is I will because I have found that sometimes – because they don't do a chamfer. They, like, do – I don't know what they, they do – sometimes when I'm seeing I'll get I feel a little inconsistency so I and that just I don't like it and every now and again I'll see a little you know that little burr you'll get of copper mm -hmm. um that yeah and I so I just kiss it um with my because I I do 1.840 no 540 for my trim length and that just barely kisses the their brass and it works perfect puts a chamfer on it and then i don't that's it that's all i do and then throw it in my 
thing and away we go. Yeah, neck tension is one of the few things in reloading that's really critical. There's a lot of things that that you, people think matter that don't matter. I have yep. shot some quarter 100%. minute groups using primers that were 10 years old. And, uh, but neck tension, in fact, about the only two guns I've ever had come back to the customer said wouldn't shoot. Both of them had like 11 thousandths crimp on the neck. You couldn't, when I went to beat the bullets out of the cases to see what, how much powder they were using, you couldn't get the bullet out. And uh, so, Funny. yeah. So, I mean, that's, yeah. that neck tension is a big deal. So, it's funny you say that because uh, <clears throat> I bought some primers with a guy. Uh, I got a little worried, and so we bought some primers. We bought them off this old guy, and uh, we bought a million primers between the two of us, I think, for like pennies on the dollar. And and it was like last fall when things were getting real tight, and I had enough to get by, but I was just worried. So we bought a shiz load of them, and uh, – if people knew the type of primers I was using right now, they'd be a little bit suspect. It doesn't seem, my experiment says it doesn't matter. I mean, I've taken them no. out of a tray, a tray that's been in my shop for 10 years, and they were and they were Remington or Winchester primers to begin with. They weren't even good primers to start with. Put them in some in some of my 7300s I built and had them shoot, you know, an SD of seven, you know. So oh, yeah, I'm getting I'm getting extreme spread of right around 15 over like you know 10 15 rounds uh i think last time i did it was 13 rounds and it was 16 feet per second extreme spread and uh and that was right before i went up to parma and <clears throat> these primers i actually have to sort them because i you don't really know what they are and so you sort them into what looks the same that's disturbing and you're and then you anxiety like royally. And right, then you, so Paul, you said his annealing was the only thing that gave you anxiety. Is there anything else you'd like to I, add to that list? I'm now? just gonna tell you, you go to a match and they'll be hanging out with him right up till the time he loads that first round, and then he's gonna have about a 25 yard clear space around him on every stage. I promise you. You know what's funny is is I you know, and knock on wood, I I usually don't have a lot of issues that in that department because I think a lot of people do other stuff that really ends up you know getting them in a bind as, as long as you stay if you, as long as you like you said there's a lot of things that don't make a big difference and uh you know like i they all i'm like i i think i i make it sound worse than it is because i mean i've pretty well diagnosed exactly what they are uh so other than ccis i will say i'm using ccis right now and they're ccis that's what I know. We'll there's CCI's, there's say CCI's that fit in the hole, and they work really good. Just the only difference is, is you know, I think I think that I know the pistols are 17 thou cup thickness, and and uh, the guy the guy we bought them from had done a crap load of testing on them, and he's like, you know, he says I've ran them in a lot of ARs, a lot of this, and he says uh, ignition is the same. He says the cup thickness is different. And he says, that's your big deal. So you don't want to be running hot loads with these. So that's, I just don't run anything hot. Everything's light. Uh, make sure they pass a water test, everything like that. And then it's good. So I, you know, I make sure that everything's, everything's safe. And if I, if I, you know, anything happens, I don't want, I don't, you know, we, there's enough times that I've shot in sideways rain and stuff like that, where rain's going to come along and you don't want to be blowing nothing up and having any issues and you know so yeah uh, the the only time the brass thing you know i bought some brass off a, a guy that was my neighbor and or and i know him really well and he's like these are all pretty good you know there's a couple of them in here that might be a little older but pretty good and i was like okay and i loaded it up took it to the ag cup and man i was i was uh there was a few times where i i pulled the trigger and well, I, 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 I hear you. Yeah, there's a hollow sound when it hit the ground. And I was like, oh, shoot, that's not good. And so I sure enough, I pick it up and a quarter of it, it split out. And I was like, what the crap? So that brass got thrown away as soon as I got home. Wow. Greg, you got one more live? You're muted. I'm muted. So you guys can hear me coughing over here. Uh, John Wade said, water test, question mark. Uh, 
good. You go. You want to go, or, is, or I'll, I'll, I'll let you take it. Okay. Uh, you just take a water bottle out to the range. It's probably a pretty good idea. You don't want to be running like. That's why I run. I prefer a dasher to say a br or bra. I'm not saying br bra is bad because you can run them light too. And and honestly, this game is not about uh, you know an extra hundred feet per second. It's about it's about consistent breaks making sure every bullet goes in the same spot so for me the dasher does that and allows me to run that 2800 to 2850 with a 109 110 class bullet but uh and be able to go dump a dump my dunk my mag in a, a tank of water or just I, you just dump a uh, dump a water bottle over it and then get it all wet shake it out um simulating like if you have rain or whatever so you got wet rounds and there's water on it and then you put it in your gun and you shoot it and, and you make sure that you don't go over pressure um that that right there i've watched a lot of guys all of a sudden rain comes or the heat comes and they start blowing primers popping primers doing stuff like that that you know because you know you fly a long ways to shoot these things and you'd hate for an extra 50 feet per second cost you you know, not being able to shoot. So you just, you just, there's no need to run there. You can run 2,700 feet per second. No, that is one of the biggest mistakes I see. Another thing that will happen is customers will buy a suppressor. If you go from, if you have a, if you have a borderline hot load and you go to a suppressor, David McNeil, who I, I have all the respect in the world for, he's a great shooter, but he, he called me one day and said he'd started blowing primers. And I said, well, what did you change? He said, nothing. And he said something about a suppressor. And I said, yeah, you can't. That retains a whole lot more heat into the chamber. And he was running this stuff. But you'll start to get um, a lot of uh, velocity variations under very slight temperature changes. And it's just, man, there's just no upside. There's really no upside to running your stuff right up near near the top end of the pressure curve. Uh, there's really nothing but downside. Oh, yeah. I agree 100%. That's yeah, and that that water test for me, I don't know what, about how you do it, but that's that's just one way to be able to make sure that things are definitely well within safe margins, and you're not going to get in a bind. Happens all the time. It's PRS for the Precision Rain series. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you got to make sure that you uh, you said that it can withstand the rain. I learned that one of like my very first PRS match at LRSC. Yeah, that was an interesting match. It was very wet and muddy and nasty. But any more lives, Greg? We are good on the live side. All right. Well, I think that we can wind this one down then. I just want to thank you, Morgan, for coming on and spending what an hour and a half almost two hours while you're sitting at the range and uh no problem we enjoyed talking to you i think everybody wanted to kind of talk to the guy that came out of the blue and is blowing everybody out of the water this year so good luck for the rest of your season at prs and ag cup it'll be interesting to watch you the rest of the time so well i appreciate it yeah keep doing what appreciate you're doing, you guys man. have me on you get well, it. You thank you figure it out. just keep doing what you're doing that's right. Thank you. And with that, we will see y'all next week on the Shears Mindset. <laughs>